people are wondering, is my gold or silver going to be confiscated? Um, anything you could tell us about what actually happened during that period of time and whether that's a legitimate risk? The land of Arcadia. Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. As we continue our coverage of the silver world, I suppose if people are watching this one on Wednesday, October 28th, where I'm recording with my good friend Scott Craig of the Silver Independent over there. Hopefully people are uh, <laughs> keep reeling it in today. Not Hopefully no one's jumping off the ledge like the silver price did. Um, and Scott, I am looking forward to seeing if you can explain what caused silver to go from 2450 down to 23, back up to 2350 throughout the span of this fascinating trading session. Although real quick, before we welcome Scott on in, I'd like to mention, and if you can see, I've got my First Majestic silver shirt on, because this video is sponsored by First Majestic, run by Keith Newmeyer, who you all met at Silverfest and has been on the show. And certainly, um, well, First Majestic's down today, but if you're of the school of thought that no matter how much paper silver you sell, the underlying dynamics are there. Well, certainly First Majestic, a stock to check out and be aware of. We will have a link to Keith at the end of that at today's show, so you won't even have to click to go anywhere to do it. But with that said, to explain uh, all of the activities of the silver world, the history of the <laughs> silver, we're also gonna talk, uh, I had a question about whether gold or silver might be confiscated again. So Scott Craig of the Silver Independent, great website, by the way, in the description link below. Great to have you on in here today. Uh, nice to see you again virtually. I'll be seeing you in person in another day or two. So how's everything going today, Scott? Uh, Chris, it's going great. I can't wait to see you tomorrow. And uh, yeah, it's an uh, exciting time in the silver market. Bad news today, obviously. Um, but it's good, good to be back on your program. Yeah, well, it's great to have you here. I'll pull the chart back up, although I have a question already on what you just said. Um, is it good or bad news that silver has gotten thumped pretty good today? Um, and I say that in the sense that certainly I've had my years of being all in on silver and then, you know, it goes down a dollar on no particular news. Um, and I've found that frustrating, I guess, in recent months. Something I've put a lot of effort into cultivating is to be able to say, all right, well, silver is gonna do what it's gonna do. I have my belief of where I think it's going to go. And if I can change my mindset and say, all right, well, uh, actually, ironically, in this case, I was bidding for some silver mining shares the other day, didn't get filled, so, I'm going to have the opportunity to buy it a little bit lower, which I'm not saying to, to brag or anything like that, but just Scott, I, I love your perspective on these things and it would be great to get your take where there's the pros and cons of it. And if we try and find the advantage, uh, anyway, I'll stop and let you take it from there. Yeah, Chris, no, I, I think you're right to put it in these terms that uh, there's really two ways to look at this. If you're a long-term value investor, uh, the fact that silver is going down is a good thing, of course, right? Because it means that you get to load up uh, either on the real stuff or the miners if you prefer. Um, if you're a short-term trader and uh, you wanted to sell, you know, today would not be a good day to do it, obviously, as uh, it has gotten pummeled. And, you know, we should add a little context here that over the past, I'd say, about two weeks, uh, silver has been incredibly range-bound. Uh, between the $24.5 level. Uh, so this price action today is, it's a rather sudden dip and it seems to be going on across all the markets. Yeah, it certainly does. And I will pull up, uh, one second, the chart of the last uh, two months here where you see, you know, we made up to $29, then it's floated around down to 22, back up to 24, 25. Um, so it is floating around in that range. Scott, is that a range that makes sense to you for silver to be floating around 25 bucks or so, given what we see happening in the world? Uh, 
Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, to put it in the, the simplest terms, you know, we're looking at uh, what the media is telling us is the most important election in American history. Um, I think they might even claim that it's the most important election in human history, right? They, they would probably put it in those terms. Uh, so if you think about silver as a safe asset, uh, it would make sense that more people would want to put money into that safe haven uh, to prevent any sort of um, loss uh, as a result of the, the current chaos that's going on, not just in this country, but really around the world right now. Yeah, and we actually are seeing that. Um, here is weekly silver holdings. Um, so <laughs> quite a lot of people taking your advice there, Scott. And um, it's just uh, an interesting time with silver where, I don't know, I like thinking about the conditional probability element of it where, again, uh, I don't know what's gonna happen to silver the next half hour or the next day, um, but I don't see how the bigger forces are overturned of what's happening in the long term. I don't know how long that'll take to play out. It seems to me that, I don't know if I have to wait five years or 10 years, I don't, to be clear, I don't think it will be anywhere near that long. But even if I did, given what's happening, when it finally plays out, it seems like, it's not like you're gonna get a double, but some amount more than that, which to me makes it worth the wait. Uh, what would you say to that, Scott? Well, I, I think you bring up a good point. And one thing I would say is you've often heard the expression that uh, prices often go up in uh, on an escalator and they come down down in the elevator, right? That means that uh, towards the end of, uh, of these uh, fiat monetary regimes, things tend to happen very quickly. And so this is why you see the word collapse, uh, I think a lot in the alternative media as people are sort of warning that, uh, you know, things are going exponential right now. And as a result, um, the end is going to move a lot faster uh, than the rest of the time on the fiat monetary system. Well, certainly I would agree with that. Scott, I have another question for you here. Obviously, I report on the show and speak to a lot of people about what I would call manipulation in the silver market. Despite JP Morgan being fined uh, $920 million in addition to the other banks that have been fined, now I hear people are critical saying, well, it was manipulated, it was not suppressed. Okay, that's fine. I don't really care what you call it, manipulated, suppressed, fair, unfair. In fact, you know, and uh, to be clear, the point to me isn't, you know, I'm not like, maybe it sounds like it some days, but I'm not trying to sit here crying about it or say it's manipulated or this or that, but just really the takeaway being that whatever you call it, what happens with the COMEX price of silver has never in any remote way to me matched what is actually happening with what people are doing with physical silver. So simply, you know, all right, fine, it's manipulated, it'll probably be manipulated tomorrow and the day after that. Yet what is relevant is that if that analysis is correct, whether it's fair or unfair or Santa Claus likes it or, you know, banks get fined, they do it again. To me, what, the only thing that's really relevant is that if there's a lot more, if the paper trading is exponential in size to the underlying fundamentals, I don't know how long it'll take to play out, but is, do we know the ultimate end outcome, even if we don't know the timing? I think, in fact, yes. Uh, and that is, again, you know, we as historians, one of the things that we like to do is look at uh, very long time periods of history, right? And uh, for most of human history, uh, we haven't had paper money. You know, paper money is kind of an anomaly. It comes and it goes. Uh, but, you know, gold and silver coins uh, and bars, you know, th they last forever. They last beyond various monetary regimes that have existed throughout world history. Uh, so I, I think the ultimate outcome is clear, uh, and that is that when this fiat monetary system does end, 
uh, the beneficiaries are going to be the people that hold the physical asset. Uh, and so this is one reason why I think it's a good idea for people to uh, stop obsessing about the dollar price and start thinking in terms of ounces, right? How many ounces do you have? Don't think about what it's worth in dollars. Think about you know, how, how big is your stack in terms of the weight? Uh, and the reason I say that is because that's how people almost always have thought about money. You know, this is the weights and measures that we see throughout history. You know, pe people didn't think about dollars. They, they thought, how much does your, your silver or gold coin weigh, <laughs> right? So that, that's the perspective that I think would be very helpful uh, for people to adopt. Well, that actually brings up a good question because Scott, as some people may know, you were, you put on quite a presentation at Silverfest, which you reminded me of when you mentioned the history of silver. And when it finally arrives, you're, you won a first majestic silver cube. See, I'm gonna pull up the, that one too so people can see. It's actually quite cool. Um, by the way, they got sold out. So we're a little bit on back order there. But um, again, you mentioned the history of silver. And a question I had, someone wrote in asking about this and I figured you'd be a perfect person to ask. They were wondering about the gold confiscation back in the 30s. Uh, many people wonder, real quick, here is the silver cube that Scott won. It's like 27 of these little thingies in there. So we'll have that coming your way soon. And, um, but back to the history, you know, we, people are wondering, is my gold or silver gonna be confiscated? Um, Anything you could tell us about what actually happened during that period of time and whether that's a legitimate risk now? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll start with uh, the executive order. It was executive order 6102 uh, that uh, Roosevelt ordered uh, to uh, quote unquote confiscate uh, the gold of the American people. And uh, I use that word confiscate loosely because nowhere in the executive order did he actually use that word. Uh, it was for people to turn in uh, their, their gold coin, uh, bullion, uh, et cetera, uh, to the government. And uh, there's actually a big debate about, you know, what do we call this? Is it confiscation? Is it nationalization? Um, and I would argue that, in fact, uh, there's more similarities to eminent domain, right? This idea of eminent domain, uh, that is to say the government can come in and uh, give you money for your property in exchange for your property. Uh, so for example, you know, if we think of eminent domain, if the government is planning on building a highway, they might purchase somebody's house, uh, or if a shopping mall is going to be built, you know, they might purchase somebody's property. Uh, so I think in some ways, uh, you know, gold, this idea of gold confiscation is, is more like eminent domain. Um, now, <clears throat> whether or not uh, gold can be confiscated again, I'd say that we're in a very different position now uh, than we were in 1933 when Roosevelt's executive order was issued. And what I mean by that is that in 1933, gold was money, right? So everyone that had money, whether it be paper or gold coin, uh, they had a claim on gold or they had gold itself. Now today, uh, that's not the case. Uh, and if you listen to various analysts uh, about the, the gold market, for example, uh, they often say that, you know, it's less than, than two or maybe even 1% of investable assets are in physical gold. Uh, so people just don't have a claim on gold anymore. So I would say that it, it in fact, does not make sense uh, for the government to confiscate it today. So it's a very different scenario. Although, Scott, you said people don't have a claim on gold. I remember, I know this is, you know, like dating myself here, but there was a day where what the dollar actually represented was supposedly an amount of gold. And we're, of course, long past that, right? Yeah, correct. So uh, a, a dollar uh, is a piece of paper, right? It's, it's kind of this uh, shared dream that we're all living that this, this device, which often, you know, it's not even a piece of paper anymore. It's a digit on your screen. 
uh, we believe that it has value, uh, whereas gold itself, of course, has real intrinsic value and has thousands of years, which is why human beings have always wanted to hold it. Yeah, and that makes sense. Um, it was also interesting how you mentioned that government may one day say, well, we need this house so we can build a road, because it's an interesting dynamic where maybe this will sound wild, but the premise that Fed prints money to buy assets. I mean, you know, the treasury has already become a hedge fund over the last 15 years, possibly the world's worst, least profitable hedge fund if you take away their printing press. Um, but I mean, it, it really sets up, and I think that's what, especially with the election right around the corner, you know, not trying to exaggerate or sensationalize things, but I mean, we're not... I mean, we have national banks printing money to buy stocks, which is a little utopian or not, or no, it's not dystopian, rather, <laughs> opposite yeah. of utopian. Uh, I mean, it's like, where, where does it end? Where does this stop or is there no end? Uh, well, I think there's two perspectives here. One is that, you know, they've known that it was going to end for a very long time. So. There's the theory that there's going to be a reset, right? We've heard that term from uh, the World Economic Forum. They, they call it a great reset where, you know, things are supposed to change somehow, uh, economically, socially, environmentally, and so forth. Uh, perhaps they do have a plan to do something like that. Uh, that's one possibility. The other possibility, of, of course, is that this continues. Uh, and so that means much more chaos. That means a lot more uncertainty. And uh, to your point, it means a lot more money printing, uh, which is just going to fuel the chaos even more. Uh, and so that's what happened in Weimar, right? That's what happened in Weimar, Germany in the 1920s. So if uh, the government is smart, uh, I would think that they would want Scott, a more Scott, gotta organized stop. reset. <laughs> I got to stop you right there. You said, if the government is smart, come on now. Right, right. Yeah. And so uh, that may be one reason to prepare for the opposite, right, which is uh, the continuance of money printing. So that is certainly a possibility. Yeah, yeah. And uh, again, uh, just <laughs> just reminded me because as, as we mentioned before, I've been driving around a lot and we hear all these government plans and it seems like they always harp on road infrastructure as being like what's holding back America. And as someone who's driven across the country multiple times, it's always a little bizarre because, I mean, it's not, I'm not driving anywhere and there's like bridges falling over. Or, I mean, you know, I mean, sure, there's some roads that can be paved a little more, but, you know, again, the idea, well, let's solve the economy, let's repave the roads, create some jobs is the American way. Although another one I'd love to get your take on, I'm guessing you've heard of this before. That similar era around FDR, Scott, are you familiar with the business plot where, as I've learned, there was some of the banks, uh, I believe the JP Morgan name uh, pops up, that actually attempted to overthrow FDR in the early 30s. Have you ever uh, read or heard about that? Uh, I don't know a whole lot about it. I know there's a little bit of literature out there on the topic, um, but you know, this is one of those things. And um, if, if you take a history course, for example, uh, that does not appear typically in history textbooks. Uh, and so, you know, that's actually one thing that I would say to your viewers is that if you're interested in the subject of, you know, these, these alternative versions of history, um, that you won't find typically in textbooks, uh, you, you have to dig a little bit. You have to go outside of uh, the academic system uh, and you have to try to find other sources of information uh, like Arcadia Economics, for example, uh, the, the mainstream media by Chris Marcus, uh, who can tell you all about these really interesting things that you'll never learn in college, for example. Well, to be completely fair and honest, I mean, I just go to the silverindependent.com <laughs> written down over there, and then I just had a Ben Bernanke joke on and make it into a show. Uh, 
Well, Scott, you know, we, I, maybe this could be a regular segment when we have you on the show, which hopefully we'll be doing more often. We asked you at Silverfest to share something that folks probably aren't aware of. Uh, and you told a great story, which got you that first Majestic Silver Cube. Um, perhaps the last one for you today. Is there something you could pass along to silver investors? I don't know, maybe it's something that we've already talked about and is worth repeating, or is there, of all the, you have such a great body of knowledge and with people out there, many of whom are new to this, um, is there anything that you would pass along that is, is something people would really be able to understand and perhaps even put into action, even if it's just an idea or a thought concept? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to uh, speak to Silver, uh, because obviously we're both so passionate about it. Um, one of the things that I would say is that, you know, I've, I've been going through mainstream media articles for a long time now, just so many different articles about uh, different facets of the economy, some of them having to do with Silver, very few, of course. Uh, but the ones that the mainstream media produces about silver itself always speak of it as the industrial metal. Uh, and they do that to sort of poo-poo it, right? To, to sort of make people think, oh, hey, it's not precious, it's not valuable. Even though historically it has been money, you know, since for thousands of years. Um, and, you know, I think that we have to flip that on its head and remember that uh, the industrial component of silver actually makes it much more valuable. You know, the more uses it has, the more uh, it's expended in the economy through various uh, facets, whether it be, you know, green energy, solar panels, technology, um, you know, as an antimicrobial. I mean, there's so many different uses for silver. And, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't make sense to think that that would make it less valuable. It makes it more valuable. And when people start to get their head around that, I think that it really changes their perspective of uh, silver as a precious metal. I think that's a great point, Scott, because in the debate between gold and silver, and they say gold is money, as much as I like gold, we're not currently using it as money. And a lot of the basically almost the entire, I mean, there's some jewelry demand, but most of the gold demand is based on people continuing to value it as money, which I think will happen more and more in the long term. But just as a comparison, I think you still have that with silver, the investment demand. But like you said, so much is being eaten by industry. Um, everything that I see continues to show that's going to increase. So I uh, appreciate you sharing that. And Scott, perhaps before we wrap up, can you let folks know, uh, I'll have the address in the link below, but tell them about the site. I'd love to know what led you to start this site, how long it's been going on for, and maybe you could share that and what they get there. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, well, uh, the Silver Independent is a 2020 baby. Uh, it is uh, something that I began this year because I, I have a passion for silver, uh, having read uh, a lot about it and uh, beginning to understand its uh, real value as opposed to what the media tells us its value is. Uh, and so I, I started this site because I wanted to really help other people, sort, sort of educate other people, tell the silver story uh, so that other people could, could learn about it. Uh, the way that I did. Um, and, you know, one of the difficult things is that if you're just starting out, there's there's not a whole lot of sites to go to on the internet to find information about uh, the precious metals. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's it's really the, the bullion dealers uh, that have a lot of the news about the precious metals on their own. And there's almost no sites that are dedicated exclusively to silver. So I think that that's one thing that makes our site different. Um, so we, we try to educate people about its value, uh, but we also have a little bit of fun too. You know, we post stories uh, about uh, local coin shops, for example, uh, you know, stories that uh, you probably wouldn't find anywhere else about silver. We, we posted a story the other day about uh, Vikings using silver uh, in their coins and how uh, their use of silver allowed them to expand their empire uh, in the far north. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun, and I've got to meet a lot of great people uh, like yourself, Chris. 
Well, that's kind of you to say that. And uh, I'm pulling something up again here. I, I can't behave myself today because let me get your site back on the screen. One of the things I love about it is that, I mean, it's like a blog with the silver stories. There's Craig Hemke, Kitco, uh, you know, where it's like if you want to find out what's happening on silver versus, real quick before we wrap up, let's do a little comparison to the Wall Street Journal and where's Commodity and Futures. So Scott, we're gonna stack you up against the Wall Street Journal. I know they have a big budget, long history, so probably unfair, but if you want silver information, um, here in the commodities section of the Wall Street Journal, I don't see anything covering today's move. Um, we see two articles on the 28th. Uh, apparently nothing happened in silver or any other commodities <laughs> since the 22nd. Um, <coughs> So I would say that if people think what you said today makes sense or any of the things I'm looking at and they'd like rather than reading uh, how new coronavirus concerns are driving the sell off in raw materials, which seems a little bit difficult for me to believe is a good interpretation of what's happening. Well, you can come over to the silverindependent.com and find what Scott has laid out here. Uh, and that's what I like to do rather than the Wall Street Journal. So Scott, I thank you for all that you've done in creating the site and coming on and sharing this great information with folks. And uh, thank you for being here. And we'll be looking forward to doing this again soon. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure. All right. And folks at home, again, if you are in love with silver like I am, to find out more about today's sponsor, well, here's a fun talk with Keith Newmeyer from the recent Silver Fest, and it is coming your way now.